Hi, Rachel. Um, Hi, Sophia. So Rachel Mead is a poet, writer, and arts reviewer from South Australia. She's led an eclectic life, working as an archaeologist, environmental campaigner, and a bookseller. She has an honours degree in classic archaeology, a master's in environmental studies, a PhD in creative writing, and is an affiliate of the J.M. Coetzee Centre for Creative Practice at the University of Adelaide. Her debut novel, The Application of Pressure, was released by a firm press in May of this year. She's also previously published four collections of poetry and has won and been shortlisted for various literary prizes for her poetry, including the Baranga Fiction Prize. Welcome, Rachel Mead. Oh, thank you very much. It's an absolute <laughs> pleasure to be here. It's a pleasure to have you here. Um, so to kick things off, for those, of us, for those of us who haven't had a chance to read your book yet, could you give us a summary of the novel? Sure. Uh, well, the application of pressure follows the career of two paramedics working in Adelaide. And so it spans around about 20 years and each chapter revolves around a different medical emergency that they attend. So uh, some, of the, some of the work is, um, is quite grisly and awful. Some is uh, just bizarre and strange. And yeah, so there is light and shadow in it. It's not all uh, yeah, terrible tales of, of tragedy and woe. No, that's true. <laughs> it's a really good mix. Um, you've done so many things in your life, as we've just heard. How long have you been writing for and what made you decide to pursue it as a career? Uh, I started writing around about uh, 2005, but just at, in poetry. And it wasn't until about, and that was just as a, as a pastime, just something that I enjoyed doing. And I didn't really start to take it seriously until about uh, 2010, I would say. And from that point, and then it was still poetry. I was, um, I was very deeply into, into writing nature poetry. And, but as you can imagine, um, you don't make a hell of a lot of money writing poetry. <laughs> so the financial imperative started to sneak in there a bit. And, I, um, and so I decided that I would give a red hot go and try and write something that, um, that more than five people in Adelaide would be interested in reading with, yeah, with my fingers crossed. So yeah, that was, that was how I made the decision. But I only, um, I, I really just started writing short stories because even though I'd always been an avid reader, I really didn't uh, uh, have any idea of um, the nuts and bolts of how to write a novel. So I tried to start with short stories and uh, just did the odd one here and there, not realising how tricky short stories are, which is why when you read the book, you can see it sort of does read like a, um, a novel that's made up of a whole set, like each chapter sort of feels like a little short story yeah. all linked together. Yeah, you could almost read each chapter individually if you... It's because each little emergency is, is a bit different to the last one. Yeah, oh, that's... Yeah. Oh, good. I'm, I'm glad. <laughs> <laughs> um, so after the poetry and you, uh, so you decided to write a novel, was, was it just for the financial and, or was, it, was there another thing that gave you that push to, to write a long form novel? Oh, look, I was, yeah, I was being a bit glib. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're okay. <laughs> well, I mean, well, um, it's funny. It's just one of those things that whenever you speak, to people about about write if you you know get into one of those conversations and they ask you what you do and you say that you're a writer they generally the next thing they say is oh have you written anything that I would have read and it's like oh I don't know I might have just met you I don't know what sort of book you're into what a question <laughs> but generally speaking when you're a poet the answer is always no because <laughs> Yeah, the only people that read poetry are other poets, generally speaking. So, um, 
Yeah, I just, and then the other thing that they say is, oh, don't worry, you know, you could be the next JK Rowling. And um, yeah, you know, pulling the, the you know, the, the one mega rich sort of famous <laughs> author out of the air. And no, yeah, so, no pressure. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, um, yeah, on the scale between poet and JK Rowling, I think I'm now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Did you find it difficult to move from writing poetry into writing a long form novel? Yeah, it was really tricky. Uh, the uh, there there's so much to um, there's so much to know about writing a novel um, that, and I had thought that being a reader that I would somehow understand, you know, when you read enough novels, you think you understand how they're all put together. But I didn't, um, my first couple of attempts were just terrible. They were, um, I didn't, as a poet, I don't know anything about writing dialogue or, you know, constructing a, a narrative arc or, um, character development, that sort of thing. So uh, this, the learning curve was really steep. And my first couple of attempts were very much um, along the lines of just um, basically just writing down anecdotes as if I was having a chat with somebody in the pub and telling a story. And but then when you read those back, you realise, well, actually, no, that doesn't really, uh, the expectations you have as a reader of a good story are quite different to the expectations that people have if you're telling them a, a good oral story. So, mm. yeah, so I had to learn all of those elements of, of storytelling for, uh, for structuring, yeah, for structuring a book, which did take quite a while because yeah. Um, yeah it's one of the, and it's just it's so demoralizing when you think you know something and then you realize that no nah, you're completely ignorant and you've got to start from the very beginning <laughs> we made it and you did an awesome job <laughs> oh thank you it took a very long time though like i wrote my first short story um in 2012 and the book came out this year so oh wow yeah so while yeah. And what was it about this novel in particular that that made you want to write it? Well, um, my husband is a paramedic and he's been a paramedic for the last uh, 27 years. 27, 23, I don't know, over 20. <laughs> a like long that. time. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so... I've, I've got this wonderful uh, repository, really, of these fantastic stories. And, and, um, but, and so when I first started writing these, it was very much because I wanted to, to capture some of the, just the phenomenal things that, that he sees and does as part of his job. But as time went on, I realised that there was something else that was really, that was almost more important to, to convey and which was, um, you, know when you, you know when you watch those reality television programs about um, paramedics and ambulances and they generally seem to focus on the, um, you know, quite uh, understandably, they focus on the, the trauma of, of the, the patient. Mm -hmm. And what I wanted to, to sort of um, start digging into was uh, what it's like to, to, to be an emergency health worker for over the, the span of many, many years as a career. So, to, so patients, you know, have this overwhelming trauma, um, but that's one day in their life. And paramedics... Um, you know, they they go to, you know, 12 to 20 of those um, traumas just in the span of one working shift. So, wow. so I really, and so um, I wanted to, to write something that started to, to show people that, um, that the, the trauma of being a paramedic 
is um, yeah is something that really needs to be considered as well because yeah over the long term that can really compound and um, and it takes its toll when it's when that's what you do for a living. Yeah, I can imagine. Um, I think it's it's a really timely novel. I know it took you a very long time to write it, but the fact that it's come out now in a world that's recently really started celebrating our frontline workers through the pandemic, it's, it's, which is very well deserved and a long time coming. I've worked in a bit of medical as well. Um, all frontline workers do an amazing job. Was, was, so obviously celebrating the paramedics, was that something that was what you had in mind when you started writing the novel? Yeah, I did. Yeah. The, um, oh, I just think that, what it takes, I, th I just think that to be in a, a, an, not just an emergency health worker, but to be any sort of emergency service worker, mm. like a, um, a fireys and police officers, um, you know, um, all of the staff that work in the emergency department in hospitals, um, I just think to be the sort of person that sees something devastating and run their their instinct is to run towards it um, and to help. I just think that that is um, a really rare and um, and such a phenomenal um, sort of person, that, that characteristic. And that, yeah, so, and to see, and just to live with a paramedic who does that day in, day out, and comes home with stories that just, uh, um, I've, I know, I mean, I am a bit of a wuss, I've got to say. <laughs> but um, I just, yeah, I, I think most people, when you talk to them about this sort of work, they know instinctively whether they could be a paramedic or whether they, they couldn't, you know. Whether, yeah. Uh, yeah, whether they, you know, they get a bit faint at the sight of blood or, yeah, or just find it really difficult to um, interact with people in pain. Um, yeah. So yeah. I just thought there, um, and there aren't many books out there. I think that that really, um, that really look at um, at that side of things. They look at the patient side rather mm -hmm. than the yeah the, the professional yeah. side. Yeah, you definitely need to be a, a special kind of person to do that as long term as a career. I'm sure. I don't think I couldn't do it. <laughs> Oh, look, they're, yeah, that's phenomenal. I, I can't yeah. even watch a horror film. So, <laughs> so having to show up, um, yeah, and, you know, work in an ambulance and be hosing blood out of the bottom of it at the end of the day. And, uh, yeah, I was, when I read the book, <laughs> I was really impressed with the, the gritty details of the incidents. They did seem like things that do happen. Um, and your husband being a paramedic, were some of the incidents that you described, were they based on actual events or was there some license in them? Uh, I would say that 80% that of them were, um, have some basis in a real job. But of course, then um, writing those, you get into very uh, uh, tricky ethical um, territory. So the, all of the um, identifying details have been completely changed. So not just the names, but um, the, like all of the characters have been, um, yeah, have been created rather than based on actual people. So it was, um, yeah, so you, anyone, I, I, you wouldn't be able to recognise yourself in, in, even if you recognise the medical issue, you wouldn't recognise yourself as the person, um, yeah, who had had yeah. that medical problem. Yeah. Um, but, um, but it was really, it was really important to me, even though all of the, um, so there was all of that invention and imagination, um, that was where all of the creativity went into it, with changing all of the details and embedding each of the emergencies in sort of the fictional lives of Tash and Joel, the two mm -hmm. uh, main characters. All of the details about the medical procedures and um, and the like the anatomical and physiological details and that sort of thing. It was really important to me to get that 
as accurate as possible. So yeah, I had um, I really felt sorry for Andrew, my husband, <laughs> who had to read so many drafts of me getting so many things wrong, saying, "Oh, what? No, you would have killed that person. No, like this is what this is what would have happened." So yes, and oh look, I killed so many characters <laughs> by just knowing what the hell I was doing. Yeah. Well, maybe you're the next George R.R. Yeah. R. Martin instead. He likes killing his characters. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so oh, obviously, also somebody who I would love to see. <laughs> obviously, you used Andrew a lot for your research. Were there any other methods that you used to research um, medical and some of the events that you portray in the book? Uh, oh, look, I did. <laughs> they say don't use Dr. Google and yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, there, was a, well, there was quite a bit of research, um, yeah, other sort of bits and pieces of research. But, but really, when it came to uh, trying to, um, the, the thing that I really wanted to achieve with the book was uh, for readers to be able to, when they read it, to feel like, they were sort of slipping into the skin of a paramedic and so mm -hmm. understanding what it was like to go about um, facing those traumas uh, day after day. Mm -hmm. And so really, um, and that, so, so, and so getting all of those little, um, the details about procedure and um, like ambulance procedure and medical procedure, right. And also the, um, the, the personal responses of the, mm -hmm. like how, um, yeah, so that I, I did talk to friends who were paramedics and, um, yeah, so uh, I was sort of, I was really lucky in that um, I had that access into, um, into the field. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, there's some parts of the book as well where the people around them, you see how they are affected by the paramedics' jobs as well. Was that maybe a little bit autobiographical? autobiographical from you? <laughs> uh, yeah, well, that was one of the things I also wanted to, um, to get at was the, um, how that, the, like the, the impact on the family and the broader relationships. So, um, so while it wasn't, um, I mean, certainly um, quite, there were aspects that were taken from my life, but mm -hmm. um, uh, it's, um, uh, but um, quite a bit of it was also imagined as well. Yeah. Like, I'm, um, yeah. like we're, we're fine. We're yes. not getting bored. <laughs> 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 Although um, there are dogs and yeah. So yeah. yeah. So there are, and um, I, there is a, there's a, a section in the book where it talks about a, um, a plate um, from, um, that was, at a quiz night with from, oh, from food. Yes. Yeah, I do have that on the front of my house, <laughs> but, I, but I didn't steal it. Now everyone that comes to my house says, you stole that. I mean, no, no. <laughs> um, yeah, that's creative license. Yes, yes exactly. <laughs> um, so how did you come up with the title Application of Pressure? And does it mean anything specific to you? Uh, yeah, it's, um, I, I was trying to be clever. So, um, the, um, because in, um, you know, with wounds and that sort of thing, um, applying pressure to stop bleeding is, um, yeah, is one of like a, a first aid technique. But I also, because um, of what happens in the book, uh, so, you know, how I was talking before about uh, trauma. So, mm -hmm. um there are the two main characters. One of them, um, I, I used two main characters because I wanted to talk about the two different types of post-traumatic stress disorder. Would mean there are there are there are many, but yeah. two in particular were the two that I really wanted to um, to explore. So the first one um, was to do with uh, being a witness to one a sing, single individual traumatic act and then, um, or incident, and then having the repercussions of that play out in your life. And the other one is to do with 
long-term um, exposure to trauma. So there's a chapter in the book where um, the, uh, the male paramedic Joel goes to work um, in the Solomon Islands and witnesses an event which is quite horrible and but he's in a situation where he's absolutely powerless to do anything about it and so and it's the um because of that powerlessness that um yeah that he doesn't it that has repercussions um throughout the um the rest of his career basically mm -hmm. whereas cash the female paramedic um, her storyline is very much the what happens when, um, yeah, she that's the compounding uh, continual exposure to trauma that just happens as a, a, a because of the nature of the work. So mm -hmm. yeah, so that so the application of pressure um, was meant to do those two things talk about um yeah talk about um like an emergency response um in terms of first aid but also um yeah about pressure at like um you know uh, from from trauma and having to deal with it i found the structure of the book really interesting as you said like the two main characters tash and joel pretty much narrate alternate chapters sometimes as a couple and there's some other characters along the way who have a little interjection in there too and each chapter is about a different emergency or an incident in their lives it all weaves together really really well um how did you decide on this particular structure well um when um because when i was writing it i really didn't think i was writing a novel I was actually just writing what I thought was a collection of short stories. And, and it wasn't until, and, um, and, I, and I rewrote it so many times. It was, I started off with um, just writing all of the stories in Joel's voice, that sort of, um, you know, that dark humour, sort of like bit sarcastic, mm. wise, quirky, um, sort of character. And then, um, and then I realised, oh, well, actually, that's a bit sexist because, you know, they're, and they're just playing into that idea that emergency service workers are, are all men, um, when in the paramedic service, the, the split is pretty much 50-50, that there are just as many female paramedics as there are men. So I thought, oh, don't be ridiculous, write it. We do it and write it, write all the stories from the perspective of a female paramedic. So that's, so I did that. And then I realized, ah, oh, no, it actually worked um, better with some men and some women. So then, yeah, so I rewrote it again. And, but even, but they were all still very much short stories that, um, that I really, that really the only, thread that ran through them all was that they were all paramedic stories set in Adelaide. And then when um, I submitted it to the publisher, to Affirm Press, they read it and said, oh, well, actually, this would work better as a novel. So go back and, <laughs> and write it again. <laughs> well, they didn't say write it again. They just said, like, just make the connections stronger between each of the characters so um yeah so i did that and and then thought oh I'm, what an idiot that i should have done that to begin with <laughs> so um yeah so that's how that's how it became a novel but it was only really at the last minute after um yeah the publisher yeah. told me to do it yeah. well it worked really and well it was great thank you <laughs> press they, they really they know what they're doing yeah <laughs> Um, did you want to share a part of the book with us? Ah, uh, yeah, sure. <laughs> um, I thought I would, <laughs> um, I would just start from the beginning, like just read a little bit from the beginning, if that's all right. Perfect. Oh, so this is um, uh, from the. It starts. The book starts in nineteen ninety seven. When his training officer asks if he's seen a dead body before, Joel says no. 
The lie is such a reflex that it's a long second before he registers that it's not the truth. Joel shoves open the passenger door of the ambulance and climbs out before slamming it with equal vehemence, hoping Carl wasn't watching his face. The alley is crowded with crime drama cliches, anxious neon graffiti, corroding dumpsters, and a cluster of police and paramedics whose reflective badges flash like predators' eyes in torchlight. It's only the heady stink of urine and rotting Thai food that makes the scene feel real. The lights from the police patrol at the alley's mouth splatter the dark walls with staccato bursts of red and blue. Tash is already at the far end of the alley. Her tall, uniformed figure squeezed between her training officer, Giuseppe, and a fettered dumpster. Joel wonders how many of their classmates will be marched into this tiny back street for the same impromptu lesson before the coroner's officer arrives. He threads his way towards Tash, the Gore-Tex of his brand new paramedic jacket making, making a loud synthetic swoosh each time he brushes the arm of another officer. Tash tilts her chin in greeting, then turns back towards a doorway in what would usually be the gloomiest corner of the alley, now lit by the beams of several mag lights. It's not until Joel peers over her shoulder that he sees the body. It's nothing like the other one. This is a young white guy, his skinny frame emphasised by his baggy black hoodie and loose jeans. One of his grimy sneakers, the colour of old chewing gum, is unlaced, the frayed end lying in a puddle that Joel hopes is rain but suspects is piss. He's slumped on the step, his back against the door, one sleeve pushed up and his work's in a tumbled mess by his hip. His hood is up so only his chin is visible and Joel can't tell if his eyes are open. Joel senses the two training officers watching him, so he tries for a poker face, hoping the effort isn't obvious. Carl and Giuseppe have probably laid bets on how their students will react, who will freeze, who will cry, who will make a stupid joke or poke the corpse with a stick. Tash looks composed, but Joel notes that her quiet greeting was the only moment she took her eyes off the body. The safe money is probably on her to take it in her stride. She's been top of their class from the first week, not as a kiss-ass teacher's pet, but in that quiet, diligent way of clever women who think they need to be twice as good as the men to be considered equal. Joel doesn't think this is the case, at least not anymore. He's smart enough never to, to say this aloud, especially in front of a woman he wants to ask out. Carl turns to the two students, his torch beam sliding away from the dead guy's hooded face to spotlight a smear of mud on the left knee of his jeans. Hypothetical, you're first on the scene. How do you run it? Joel sees Tash straighten her shoulders and he jumps in before she can speak. Check for consciousness, then whether the airway's clear since OD sometimes vomit, then see if he's breathing. He's about to continue when he feels Tasha's boot press into the side of his. She angles her head away, looking up, then into the shadows and corners at the back of the alley. But of course, only after I check the scene for danger, hidden assailants, physical threats, that sort of thing, Joel says, pressing his foot back against Tasha's in what he hopes she takes as a thanks. Nice save, says Carl. Giuseppe huffs in a way that makes it clear Joel's fooled no one. Then what, genius? Circulation, says Joel. Check for a pulse. Had one, I drew up some Narcan to counteract the heroin that I'm assuming he shot up from the look of his gear and the track marks on his arm. Tash crouches next to the dead man and looks at his face. She reaches towards his bare forearm, which is lying palm up on his thigh. She's just about to touch the skin when she catches herself and looks up at Giuseppe. Can I? He hesitates for a split second, then says, sure. But Joel thinks this is more because he wants to see what she'll do than because it's okay. Tash runs her fingers across the skin of the forearm, then gently picks up his arm and pushes the sleeve of the hoodie further up 
the black fleece bunching at his bicep. She brushes her fingers over the track marks as if reading a history of addiction in the braille of injection scars. It's not just the coolness or lack of pulse, it's weird. You can tell there's no blood pumping under the skin. It's inert, like dough or something, feel it. Joel is torn. It's a dead junkie for fuck's sake. And he really doesn't want Carl and Giuseppe to think he's a psycho who gets off on touching dead bodies. He knows he only passed the psych test by some quick talking in the final interview, but he doesn't want to leave Tash hanging either. She's the person he likes most in the class. She has a grin as open and wide as a farmer's and a stride that says she never wears high heels. After a long second, he steps forward and crouches beside her. She's right. The guy's flesh does feel like cool, doughy plastic. Now he's level with the guy's face. Joel can see the eyes. They're open. His lashes are pale. And in the torchlight, his irises are a cool, clear grey. It looks as if the junkie's staring straight at Tasha's stomach. The light from the police cars flashing red and blue across the glossy sclera of his eyes. Huh. They do look just like they're sleeping. Well, he would if his eyes were closed. As soon as it slips out of his mouth, Joel realises he only wanted to say something, anything, to divert the attention from the fact that he's just voluntarily touched a dead junkie. Tash looks at him. It's that blank, even expression he recognises from the faces of girlfriends when he said something catastrophically stupid. He never fully grasped the issue with what he said, but he does know that it heralds a breakup, usually within the week. Tash stands up, leaving him crouched there with the corpse. Not all dead people, she says to Joel's back. Oh, I'll leave it there. <laughs> it's a powerful start to the book, isn't it? Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, Heinley Street in the 90s. Exactly. <laughs> I do, I really enjoyed all of the references to Adelaide in the book. Um, it was so refreshing for people, I think, in Adelaide to read a book that's set here. Um, how important was it for you to set the book here in Adelaide? Yeah, it was really important. I am, um, yeah, I whenever I come across a book that's written in Adelaide as well, I love it as a local, you know, being able to, um, yeah, to, um, to, to mentally place yourself to, um, mm -hmm. yeah, it just leads to such a rich experience, doesn't it? That have that familiarity with the, with the location. So yeah, look, um, I really wanted to write an Adelaide story and, um, and also it was, um, it was really important, uh, I think, writing about paramedics to, to put all of that um, setting and geographical information in there because um, it's so, um, that's one of the things that, um, uh, that is characteristic of paramedics. They have an excellent um, sense of direction and geography because they're constantly just, you know, driving at breakneck speeds, lights and sirens throughout the city yeah. and metropolitan area. So, um, so they do have a really good um, a, a geographic sense. Um, and so uh, putting all of that in wasn't just, it was fun as a writer, but it was also really important, I think, um, you know, writing about paramedics to have that, um, that strong sense of place in there. Yeah, it was awesome. I um, yeah, I love the little touches. I love that they went for lunch at Soto's in Semaphore because that's oh, one of my favourite places to go. Yeah, oh. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think I squealed when I read that. <laughs> I was like, I go there. <laughs> oh, well, um, the best. I love. Oh, yeah. <laughs> it is. It's the best fish and chips. Uh, do you think it would translate well to readers of, of, of in other areas as well? Oh, look, that's a really interesting question. And it's funny because um, there, I think we're, uh, when you don't come from the, in Australia, if you're not from Sydney or Melbourne, 
um, you don't, I mean, we're, um, as readers, we're so used to reading about Sydney and Melbourne. Um, and, and so why shouldn't readers in Sydney and Melbourne have to read it? Well, not have to, no one's forcing it. <laughs> but like, <laughs> but I just think it's, um, yeah, look, I when as because I love reading books, um, you know, as a reader, I feel like I've got such a bizarre familiarity with uh, American cities and geography. Yeah, yeah. I feel like I know so much about New York. I think I could <laughs> navigate around without a map pretty well. And, <laughs> I agree with yeah, you. Yeah, I've never been there. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that it's, um, yeah, I, I love the fact that, um, yeah, if they read the book, then they've got, yeah, they're being introduced to, um, yeah, to a city that they may not have, may not have visited. And, and it's not, and it, so it was, when I was writing it, I also wanted to get away from all of those cliches about Adelaide, you know, the whole mm. sort of churches and serial killers and, <laughs> um, yeah, and, so, and I, so I didn't want the Moles Balls or, you know, Montefiore Hill or anything like that in there. I just wanted to have things that would resonate with, with locals, like that we would recognise and that's, you know, and that would be um, yeah, and hopefully interesting for um, yeah for readers from other cities to yeah um, yeah to understand to get um the, the the atmosphere of what it's like to live in Adelaide. Yeah. Um, so apart from being set in Adelaide, the characters do take a couple of little excursions on their on their journey. Um, Tash goes off to the Red Centre, and Joel goes to the Solomon Islands for a little while that you mentioned earlier. Are these places also places that are dear to your heart or that you've worked or visited? Uh, well, um, I've, I've visited them, um, but yeah, my husband has worked in both those places as a, as a paramedic. So um, uh, yeah, so I was able to, um, to write um, and as, as the author, give them a good sort of a, a, a full sense of place because I had been there before, mm -hmm. but, um, but then I was very much picking his brain about the types of jobs um, that, yeah, that medical workers would, uh, would experience while working in those particular places. But um, I really wanted to, uh, to just have a, a couple of chapters where it was outside the metropolitan area of Adelaide, mm. and um, to show that that para because par it's really common for um, for paramedics to uh, to to take to to feel like they're especially because it is such a a career. Um, you do the one. I mean, even though you can do different jobs within the ambulance service, um, yeah, it is you know, common for people to begin their careers there and, and retire as still as employees of the South Australian Ambulance Service. But they reach, um, I think a lot of paramedics reach a point where they think, oh, I just need to use my skills outside of this area. And so yeah. they just sort of do a bit of contract work outside, take a bit of long service leave. And yeah, so, um, yeah, so those two chapters sort of, um, incorporated, um, yeah, that sort of idea that, um, yeah, that that paramedics can they can move and do other things with um, yeah. that very particular set of skills that they have. Yeah, and be able to come back if they if that's what they want to and use their skills everywhere. Yes. Yeah. Um, what did what do you feel is the key theme or message to the book that you really wanted to to give to the readers? I think it really it does get back to that idea of um, uh, of of what it takes to do the work and how and the sort of person you need to be and the, the, the potential price that you can pay for uh, having a career where you do 
come face to face with really traumatic events every day. So, um, yeah, I really just wanted to, um, you know, to show the other side of that script where, um, yes, of course, the, um, the, the, the patients are, are the focus, but, um, but, there's, but there is more to the story than that. And that the, um, and that, yeah, while, and that paramedics, we really forget that, that they, uh, they leave that patient and basically they have very short periods of time where they're, um, they're very focused on that one person and then they never see them again. They really, and it's really rare for them to have any sort of follow up with their patients at all. It's right, okay, on to the next emergency. On to the next, yeah. On to the next emergency. So, and yeah, that and I, and that um, can really take its toll over the. Yeah. Long. It's. I mean, there's. It's such a fascinating. I, I know two paramedics and. It's always one of the, you know, when you see them in person, you're like, oh, tell me all about your work. And it's so interesting. I wouldn't want to do it myself. but <laughs> yeah. oh, And they are, do you find that your parameter, they're excellent storytellers. They're, yes. And they yeah. have a really dry, dark, sort of a little bit twisted sense of humour. Yeah. Yeah. And um, you kind of need that, I think, maybe. Yeah. Yeah, I think it is a coping mechanism too. I reckon that's um, being able to um, to frame it in that sort of um, yeah darkly um, satirical way is a way that allows you to talk about it because yeah, and you know, and of course, talking about trauma is one of the keys to yeah to being able to deal with it. So yeah, yeah. Um what's your next project rachel is there uh, anything you can share with us ah uh, well i am um i'm in the I'm, I'm currently writing another novel um but not about paramedics at all in fact there is uh, had there's no uh, there's not even, hasn't even been an injury yet no blood gore nothing <laughs> <laughs> something a bit different than this yeah, time yeah it's about antarctica so oh wow so it's um i'm looking at the um the i'm writing a sort of a creative biography of the first australian woman to set foot on antarctica and um and she was also a visual artist so she was a really yeah very interesting person so wow. yeah so that sounds what, fascinating oh she uh it, and i I'm, I'm just completely obsessed with antarctica so it's um it's sort of a challenge to write because um i can i can get i can nerd out and just put way <laughs> too many <laughs> too many just, you know very what other people will find to be very boring details in there so i need yeah. to yeah always be conscious of that yeah. Well, we look forward to talking to you about that one when that one comes out. <laughs> oh, that would be lovely. Yeah. <laughs> um, so apart from being able to check out your, all of your book, your poetry and your novel from our libraries, um, I think the link is somewhere in the chat um, or we can post it somewhere. Um, is there somewhere where our listeners can buy your books if they prefer to do that? Uh, yes, um, which would be lovely. Um, they, so... Um, so down, uh, down in the West, I think, um, there are, Dimix at Glenelg has them. So just, um, yeah, Dimix has them in prints. Um, if you're up in the Adelaide Hills, um, Childer Bookshop has them. Um, or if you want to order it online, um, also, uh, it's available through Booktopia. Excellent. Awesome. And do you have any social media accounts or anything like that where our listeners can follow you and, and get updates on your new projects? Uh, I'm, on, I'm on Facebook um, and also Instagram. So Instagram is um, Medipus and um, yeah, Facebook is just me, Rachel Me. Excellent. <laughs> and <laughs> we will find you. You'll get lots of numbers tomorrow. Uh, that's come to the end of my questions. So I'm going to hand over to Margaret, who I'm sure has lots of questions from our listeners. 
And just a reminder that if you've got any questions, just put them through. Okay. The first question is, what do you want to write next? Or perhaps a better question is, what stories do you want to share next? Ah, well, um, the next one that, um, yeah, I'm currently in the throes of writing is, um, yeah, the, um, the one that I was just, uh, that I just mentioned mm -hmm. about Antarctica. So, um, but um, after that one, I'm, I, I've got, um, this is the thing about writing is that um, when, you're, when you're bogged down in the current project, everything else seems shiny and interesting. So I've got, <laughs> I keep thinking, oh, I'm, I really want to write about, um, yeah, classical history or I really want to, yeah. So I do have a couple of projects, um, yeah, like banking up behind me, but um, I probably shouldn't jinx anything by talking about that next. Um, the next thing is the Antarctica book. So, Excellent. yeah. yeah. So, next, yeah. Sorry. Next question is, is, I have two neighbours who are paramedics. Should I suggest they read your book? Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. <laughs> well, oh, well, look, only if you get on well with them. Like, <laughs> um, Oh, look, that would be lovely. I, I, I will happily accept any um, yeah, promotional help that, <laughs> that, you, that you would like to offer. That would be really lovely. Um, yeah. The lady who asked that said, ha, 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 yes, they are great people. Oh, good. All right. <laughs> yeah, paramedics generally are, actually. That's, I'm not just saying that because I'm married to one. Um, and so, yes, I am contractually obliged to say that. But... Um, they are, I mean, yeah, like what I was just saying with Sonia before that, yeah, if you have a paramedic in your life, then you generally, um, yeah, then you will appreciate that they're excellent storytellers and they've got fantastic senses of humour. So, and they're great at dinner parties because everyone <laughs> loves a paramedic story. <laughs> okay. I'm not getting any more questions here. Um, I've I've got one leading on from that. If I know. I've got I've got all the questions. <laughs> um, do, do you find that they get um, a bit tired of people going? Oh, you're a paramedic. Tell me all your stories. Oh, I think well, um, it depends how it depends how um, social they are. You know, I'm, I think um, I. And my husband and we don't go out all that often. We're sort of a little bit. We're a bit like nervous, really, so he doesn't get overwhelmed by by it. Whereas yeah. I think that if you were out, if every dinner party was like, oh, really, and you were having to think, okay, well, what can I tell them this time? Yeah, that might get a bit wearing. But but generally, I think that um, uh, it just means that I I I don't think paramedics would easily get um, get sick. Of being um, of being found interesting and um, and being appreciated, <laughs> so <laughs> it would, yeah, <laughs> they'd have to be in a very bad mood, I think, to get to be sick of it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, well, it's been great listening to you, Rachel. We do have a poll to see how you went, but I'd also like to, um, if you'd like this event and you'd like to hear more about what's happening in the libraries, we do have a library e-newsletter where you get all the events on there. And we've got a lot of things coming up for Nunga Week, a lot of fantastic events on, so I'd like to give that a bit of a plug. But I've got a little poll for you to do, so I'll just put that up. There we go. You can just, um, I'll just launch that. Yeah. So. And I'd like to... It says I'm not allowed to vote. Oh, oh I, I can't either. I was thinking, no. oh, I can see the results. <laughs> that was really oh, good. Like... Gotcha. <laughs> and I'd like to thank um, Sonia as well. Um, Sonia, I think you could get a job at Writers Week anytime. Yes. Oh, well, it's, well, it's the dream. <laughs> oh, they were fantastic questions. Thank you so much. Oh, was it was an really absolute pleasure. Fun. I read your book before I was asked to do this, so I just leapt at the opportunity when I was asked. So it was an absolute honour to, to speak to you today. 
She did when I rang her up. She said, oh, please, can I do it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, you were fantastic. Thank you so much. I've had a great and time. You're a wonderful guest, and we hope we can interview again for your next one. Yes, I can't wait please to read back. it. <laughs> Oh, well, I've now, thank you. That's because I'm a bit stuck at the moment. So I will let that inspire me for the yeah, plowing, plowing on. <laughs> you have to go down to Antarctica to, to, to research it. That, yes, I will. I will definitely be applying. That for sure. <laughs> when we can travel again. Oh, yes. Oh. Hang on, there's another question here. One moment. I look forward to reading your book as part of Semaphore Night Owl Book Club. Oh, that sounds like, oh, I, I, I'm, so, I'm so happy that I mentioned Semaphore in there. <laughs> <laughs> so are we, especially at the library in Semaphore. But there's so many places mentioned in the book. It was awesome. Uh, it's, um, uh, it was hard to, to make the decision of, yeah, of, of what... Of what which places to you, yeah. Well, they keep, keep giving questions now. Oh, no, that's, a, oh, no, that's the same one. Yep. Somebody wrote it twice. Yeah, I really enjoyed the Adelaide references, and when you get to the fish and chip shop at Semaphore, I'd had the same reaction. I've been there. <laughs> <laughs> I think most people have been there, haven't they? <laughs> oh. I think you, yeah, if you haven't, if you live, there must be something wrong if you live in Semaphore <laughs> and you haven't, yeah, or anywhere near Semaphore and you haven't. Yeah. yeah, yeah famous. Yeah. Okay. Everybody thoroughly enjoyed the webinar, by the way. <laughs> oh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> All right. We might um, end it there.